Hi again. I told you these would be some deep videos, right? I hope I haven't disappointed you. I'm assuming that since you are watching this video that you've seen my previous videos on energy, our connection to the universe and source, as well as the flower of life and Metatron's cube. This video is going to cover Metatron's cube and the basics on the platonic solids based on the research that I've done. Who is Metatron? Well, of course, I must say, Google it. There are too many descriptions and interpretations for me to go over in one video. However, to summarize, many groups believe Metatron is an angel, that he was once human named Enoch, the most high angel, which creates a bridge between heaven and earth, or the voice of God. I'm not discounting any of those beliefs. On the contrary, I completely believe that. However, I go a bit beyond that belief. I believe Metatron is what I like to call an ultra-terrestrial being. Ultra-terrestrial is a term I've given to beings that most people call angels, gods, deities, spirit gods, and so on. I believe in many different dimensions, vibrations, frequencies, and I believe ultra-terrestrials have the ability to traverse these at will to come in and out of our third dimensional plane by consciously changing the vibration and frequency of their physical and spiritual form, their energetic form. Much like how we change the channel on a TV, these beings have the same ability to do this with their entire form by manipulating the energy within themselves and within the universe around them. I believe Metatron to be one of those beings and many others from our myths and legends who were created to help us evolve and act as a direct connection to Source as well as our guides along the way. Why is it called Metatron's Cube? Again, Google it. My research and meditation have told me that it was named Metatron's Cube as it holds the answers to all life and since Metatron is the hypothesized voice of God, I can only come to the conclusion that Source wants us to listen to what it's telling us, which I believe I have. It's within Metatron's cube that we find the platonic solids. What are the platonic solids? Well, some research states that Plato discovered these shapes in Metatron's cube. Of course, other research shows that Pythagoras discovered them 200 years prior to that. We'll go ahead and let history argue about who done it first, shall we? Here is what I know based on my research. What defines a platonic solid? A platonic solid is a three-dimensional shape whose faces are all the same shape and whose corners are at the meeting place of the same number of polygons. Meaning, if the shape has three sides, it will touch three other shapes of the same dimension. If it has four sides, it will touch four other shapes of the same dimension and so on. In science, if you look at all of the elements on the periodic table of elements, all known elements, and break all of them down to their base parts, you will see that every single one of them contains one or more of these platonic solids within them. This means that everything in our known universe is made from these sacred geometric shapes. Now it's said there are only five platonic solids. I don't subscribe to that theory, as you'll see in a later video. It is known that the entire periodic table of elements contains these platonic solids. Let's go into the five most well-known platonic solids in this video. The first is the tetrahedron. A tetrahedron is a platonic solid made from triangles. You can see that this shape is made from a total of four triangles all connected to each other. You can see that there are three sides to each triangle and they connect to three triangles of the same size and shape. The purest definition of a platonic solid as we know it. In New Age philosophy, the tetrahedron represents the fire element and should you follow chakra teachings, is linked to the solar plexus, which is the center for personal power, acceptance, and a natural balance between the physical and the spiritual. I am going to be going over chakras 
in a future video that's not part of this series. The tetrahedron is the perfect symbol for balance and stability. It's also known as the Holy Trinity. Now in math and the power of nine, which I'm going to cover in the next video, this is four triangles connected to equal the following dimensions. Pretty amazing. The next platonic solid is the hexahedron, otherwise called a cube. It is a platonic solid made from squares. This particular solid is made from a total of six squares and you can see that each of the sides connects to a square of the equal dimensions. The cube, or hexahedron, is one of the most popular solids in the world. In New Age philosophy, the hexahedron represents the earth element and is linked to the root chakra. Meditating on this shape will assist in grounding your energy, regaining your focus, removing tensions, and easing physical stresses. It will reconnect your energies to that of the earth. Now in math and the power of nine, this is six squares connected to equal the following dimensions. The next one we're gonna discuss is an octahedron. An octahedron is a platonic solid whose sides consist of eight triangles connected together. In New Age philosophy, the octahedron represents the element of air linked to the heart chakra, which is the center for love and compassion. This center includes the healing and nurturing aspects within. In math and the power of nine, this consists of eight triangles connected to equal the following dimensions. Another platonic solid is the dodecahedron, which is a platonic solid that has pentagons for its sides. This solid has a total of 12 pentagons. In New Age philosophy, the dodecahedron represents the element of the ether and is of the universe, divine creation. And this is connected with the higher chakras, the third eye, the crown, which hold the energies of meditation, higher consciousness and spiritual ascension. In math and the power of nine, this consists of 12 pentagons connected to equal the following dimensions. Now a pentagon has five sides and each corner is at 108 degrees. The last of the five best known platonic solids is the icosahedron, a platonic solid made of 20 identical triangles. In New Age philosophy, the icosahedron represents the element of water and is linked to the sacral chakra. Water is all about movement, flow, and change. It moves easily from a gas to a liquid to a solid. It can be visible one minute and invisible the next. Now in math and the power of nine, this consists of 20 triangles connected to equal the following dimensions. Pretty amazing math. Now there are two other shapes that I want you to be aware of also in this video. I believe it's vitally important you know about them to know where I'm going with all of the information that I'm talking about in this series of videos. The first is the sphere. In many forms of New Age philosophy, the sphere represents the first awareness of source, the beginning. It also represents to some what's known as the void, and to some all. So it is essentially the beginning and end of everything at once. This could very well be the connection of all that is. The first manifestation of being in this third dimensional universe. It is said that it was from this first geometric shape that all sprang from. The first sphere in the flower of life. In math, and keeping of course with the power of nine, which I'm going to go over in the next video, this is one sphere, perfect in all directions, height, width, depth, and dimension, the first object with any dimension in the universe. 360 degrees equals three plus six plus zero equals nine. Zero representing the beginning and nine representing completion. It is said that zero represents the beginning of all. 
three representing the Holy Trinity, mind, body, and spirit. And as I've stated in the previous video, six representing the seed of life or Genesis pattern of the flower of life, which all life springs from, and nine representing completion. I highly suggest to Google it. The other shape I want you to know of, and definitely Google this one, is called the star tetrahedron. This is a perfect combination of two tetrahedrons phased within each other. One has the apex facing upward to the cosmos, and the other has the point facing down into the earth. This is also known as the Star of David. There may be a relation, I don't know. <laughs> It is said that this shape represents the element of the spirit. Also, that the star tetrahedron represents the combination of the masculine and feminine consciousness. Some New Age philosophy believes that when we were beings in another dimension, there was no gender. That masculine and feminine were one, creating a perfect light being. It is their belief and my belief that being here in this third dimensional reality causes us to be separated becoming masculine and feminine. Some believe that the star tetrahedron combines both the masculine and feminine together in one, helping us become one and through a powerful meditation, aligning and opening of our chakras and opening our mind to source, taught by many but explained incredibly by Dronvalo Melchizedek, to create something known as the Merkaba, which is light spirit body, which allows us to become light beings and traverse the universe astrally and connect with the Akashic Record consciously. Oh, wow! Now, of course, in math, and keeping with the power of nine, these are two tetrahedrons phased within each other. Remember, masculine and feminine, to equal these dimensions. Now, I want you to keep in mind that every single hedron that we've gone over here has not just one, but two things in common. All of them, which basically means everything in creation, contains the digital root of nine, meaning completion. However, all of them as well, from what you've seen and heard, contain the number zero, which means that every one of these platonic solids and shapes also represent the beginning of everything as well food for thought. Now in the next video, I'm going to explain some of the awesome things and occurrences I've found in our universe and right here on Earth about the power of nine to help bring us closer to the reason for these videos and to finally bring to light on why I made them. I hope you join me and while you're here, please don't forget to check out my Facebook page, Mankind's Evolution through a true reawakening of nature, or Metatron for short. Let you let me welcome you cordially, cordially, and thank you for rising early uh, to listen to my introduction. Uh, my keywords are geometry, space, time, and consciousness. I've been uh, dealing with a science uh, for a long time, which is called uh, sacred geometry. It hasn't got a lot to do with religion, but sacred uh, has to do with holy, which means whole or all-inclusive. Uh, in school, we learn about a geometry which you might say is profane, which calculates all matters of things. Sacred geometry, though, tries to develop an understanding for the whole of the whole and to uh, try to find a language that includes all. And the interesting thing is that in uh, geometry, there are findings or pictures uh, that uh, match to a hair what uh, quantum physics and physics and consciousness research have found.
Now let me begin with a painting, The School of Athens by Raphael. And uh, I must say, this is a relatively well-known painting. It's interesting for certain reasons, because um, perspective is, um, for the first time, put to a definite use. You see that the lines um, point to one important point, which is the important one. Well, uh, the School of Athens, uh, that is many important philosophers that you can see, and their findings, and in the center, there are two who are obviously in dispute. Every, uh, both of them hold a book under their arms, uh, which is their main work. Pla Platon is on the left, on the right there's Aristotle. And both are in dispute about where the world came from, how the world arose. Look at their hands now. Aristotle. Well, uh, let's keep it low, yeah? Let's keep it low. That's the lower sphere. So the lower spheres and an upward development. But Plato does something else. He points upwards. He says, no, my dear, this is where life comes from. Plato has developed a book on the world of ideas, a sphere where information is stored, which is then mapped into our reality. Let us now submerge ourselves in the information space of geometry, and let's see where that is reflected in our reality. Now, briefly, Plato, again, and uh, in his writings, he spelled something out. It's an old finding, in fact, namely that there are five bodies, basic bodies, the uh, so-called platonic bodies. On the left, uh, the tetrahedron, then the cube, uh, the icosaedra, the octahedron, and the dodecahedron. And those five bodies, or solids, are attributed to the five elements, fire, earth, water, air, and then ether or cosmos, the life energy. That's on the far right-hand side. And the interesting thing is well, that they are sometimes seen as uh, building blocks of reality. And we'll see a couple of examples later where we'll see that that might even be true. Now let us now turn to this here. This is part of the larger picture. This is Euclides. And um, he's um, drawing with a compass, which is the main tool of geometry. And he wrote a book at the time, published it some 2,200 years ago, called The Elements. It was so important that uh, it was used as a teaching document for some 2,000 years. In the 1800s, it was still in use in British schools. And one of the fundamental mysteries in philosophy is the squaring of the circle. You would have heard of that, possibly. And uh, I'd give you a circle, and you're just allowed uh, to use two tools, a ruler and a compass, uh, to turn it into a square with the same um, area or circumference. We know it doesn't work. This is why we talk about the squaring of the circle is uh, completely impossible. But in fact, there's more to it. Uh, the two tools, uh, the compass and the ruler, described there, have two basic functions. Uh, the ruler only draws straight lines and the compass only draws circles. You might say, okay, opposite poles, or you might say that the circle stands for the female element, uh, the round, curved element, and the ruler stands for the male element, um, for the arrow-shaped, straight thing. Now, if we uh, looked at sentences, uh, the visual sense, the sense of vision, is usually described as uh, the male, a male sense, because we can kill <laughs> with our uh, glances and uh, uh, looking usually goes in a straight line. But uh, uh, the auditory sense is usually uh, the listening sense, the ears. And now uh, try to say uh, looks, if looks could kill, then, uh, well, that wouldn't work. You couldn't kill somebody with an ear, could you? In fact, uh, the ear might even open up to the other party, but you can only uh, kill with your eyes. There's an interesting phenomenon. In uh, German, we have these sayings. Um, we have um, got uh, the polarity of celestial bodies from, we say, um, the sun and the moon, but uh, the sun is uh, female in German, and uh, the moon is male. It's uh, usually exactly uh, opposite, because uh, the sun radiates light, and the moon absorbs things. And uh, usually we say uh, somebody 
if uh, if somebody is a lunatic, um, well, that is um, has to do a lot with the moon. Yeah, that is um, the fact that people are moody. Okay, and the idea that there is a creator, an original language of geometry, well, that is something that you see quite frequently, as seen just William Blake or Luca Pacioli. He's using compass and the ruler, and there's a geometric body to boot. Albrecht Dürer, you wouldn't have thought that probably, but he's quite well known here. Melancholy. You see uh, the ball, the sphere, uh, you see a magic square, and above um, the ball you see a geometric body, and do you wonder which one that might be? There's discussion about that. Then Giordano Bruno, he dealt a lot with geometry, and he has drawn things like this. This here, for instance, too. And then uh, there's uh, Johannes Kepler, John Kepler, and uh, those tools were so important to him that he had himself painted with them in hand. And he also de dealt with Platonic uh, philosophy, World Harmony is the title of the book, and a harmonic uh, picture of the world was to be created. In the book you find the Platonic solids, the bodies, as described by Plato, and uh, this is a woodcut here, which shows the elements. So you see from the left to the right, tetrahedron, um, the fire with uh, the sharpest corners, uh, then uh, the solid uh, uh, cube, earthly, uh, then the icosahedron, very close uh, to water drops. This is why you see water elements there. Uh, octahedron uh, with uh, the airy birds. And then you might wonder why the one on the right-hand side is ethereal. The dodecahedron has 12 sides. And uh, 12 is always the element around 12 months, uh, 12 uh, signs of the zodiac. 12 hours and so on. This is what you find on the outside. And also, um, a, um, a pentagon has a lot uh, to do um, with uh, life energy, and we'll see that later in a moment. This is what you can see in the dodecahedron. For Kepler, uh, these building blocks were so important uh, that he uh, wrote uh, the Mysterium Cosmographicum, and this is to uh, show the planetary orbits. This is not 100% exact, but it shows how people think. Out on the outside, there's the sphere uh, that is uh, Saturn, uh, the orbit of Saturn. And uh, inside you could have a cube, and in the cube you could have another sphere. This is mathematically correct. That's not invented by Kepler. And the distance of these spheres to one another is like the distance from the inside um, of uh, the Jupiter orbit, and the outside uh, uh, is the Saturn orbit. And of course, you could uh, further go on to nest the other planets inside, it would work out. Now, let's now turn to exact geometry. Here we have a pentagon. And in the pentagon, oh, we can put a pentagram. In the pentagram, a five pointed star, you see another uh, pentagon. And again, you could uh, find another five-pointed star inside, and so on and so forth. Huh? So, mathematics tell us today that this is a fractal, a self-similar structure, which is self-similar or scale invariant. No matter what kind of scale you have or what level of scale you're at, it's the same structures. In this triangle, you have a large triangle, then you uh, cut a one out in the middle, then you have three smaller ones which are self-similar with a big one, then you, uh, you remove another triangle from its midst, and so on and so forth. A simple example now for uh, logarithmic scale invariant where a certain factor plays a role from one step to another is the typical A4 sheet. I could fold it, and that's A5, and then it's half the size. And I can fold it again, that's A6, and again, a quarter of the A4 sheet. And no matter how big the sheet, A0, A1, A2, what have you, they are always self-similar. They have always the same relationship of sides uh, to one another. And that is a phenomenon which only works with uh, the DNA system. It doesn't work with American paper, I'm afraid. Uh, that is different from the DNA system. Now, in nature, you will find that scale invariance is a phenomenon which appears in nature quite often. You find it almost everywhere. An example here. In Nautilus shell. And you can see this chamber here self-similar to this one and self-similar to the next one. So there is a certain factor 
where Sharia appears from one chamber to another, makes them proportionate with one another. Another extreme example, the Romanesco cauliflower, um, seen from above, you see a vortex structure, and we'll return to that and see the vortical structure in more detail. One spiral runs in this way, the other round works uh, counter, contralaterally, and if you look a node of the two, of the two spirals, spirals, you find a self-similar one, one spiral um, running in one direction and the other one in the opposite. And if you look at the next node then, one spiral runs this way and the other one in the opposite direction. Uh, once you've discovered that, yeah, if you look at these uh, cauliflowers, uh, it's almost impossible to take the eyes off because it really draws you into the structure. And this again, if you're interested in uh, fractal mathematics, demonstrates quite nicely how the system continues. It's uh, self-similar or fractal. And in the course of time, uh, science has realized uh, that large parts of nature uh, are always fractal in structure and uh, that uh, uh, signals can be transmitted very easily with fractal structures. You remember telephones, uh, the big uh, mobile ones, which are huge, and you have a huge antenna, they are also small. And the size of the phone is only limited by the fact that we need to operate it. If it's as big as a matchbox, you cannot operate it, can it? Can you? But in theory, it would possibly be possible to build that small because we see how nature communicates. If somebody had told you that the cell uh, can communicate with another one electromagnetically, you might have been a laughing stock. But measuring research, that's what science uh, does, it uses the minds and then we end up with the same uh, picture. We do it smaller and smaller and smaller uh, until we reach the level of the cell and then we realize, oh, nature has done it for ages and we only learned it now. Well, knowledge about self-similar structures has been in place for a long time. Let's see, Giordano Bruno once more. He has a tree here, and you might say the four elements are rounded, and uh, self-similar or uh, square uh, structure where you have a square inside and a square without. And here also the horoscope, uh, that is uh, Wallenstein's horoscope by Kepler, is square and a square inside the square. And geometry can hardly be done without this person here, Toth, or Hermes, uh, Trismegistus, for, by the Greeks, Toth, that's the Egyptian name, and Mercurio, that is um, the Roman name. He's the god of uh, uh, writing, of wisdom, and we, um, he say something's hermetically sealed, and that, of course, has a lot to do with Hermes. Uh, he's the messenger of the gods who keeps uh, people and the gods in contact, and sometimes he's also the god of merchants and thieves. The gods of uh, traveling um, salesmen, well, you remember the Mercury Hotels, and uh, then there's somebody else who used the image. If you look at Todd, or Toth, you can recognize him by his wings on the helmet, and because he has a staff or a rod with uh, two serpents around it. And that's a transport company that uses exactly the symbolism. And you think this is an enlightened world? But really, everybody's playing uh, with the unconscious uh, symbols of the mind in our history to link up with our story, history, evolutions, and the good feelings that arise from that. This is what I found in Zurich. This is from a bank building that is uh, above uh, their main entrance door. And then uh, there are the hermetic uh, laws by Todd, and we find one, the principle of correspondence and analogy, as above so below, as without so within. You will have heard about that, but this is exactly what we're talking about. Geogra geometrical structures which are nested or repeat one another, repeat themselves. And this is how it ex is it expressed. This is a drawing for a cathedral. Uh, the cathedral should map man or should reflect and represent man. And uh, now, um, 
uh, if we take it from a philo philo philosophical point of time, uh, point of view, uh, church is to get people in contact with the divine. If you want to achieve that, uh, human geometry and divine geometry are the two factors that you have to know. And uh, since Leonardo, we know about human proportions. That, in fact, has become a science uh, of its own right, in its own right, something that people have dealt with over and over again. And here, um, the masters uh, who dealt with uh, the science used uh, the stonemason's marks. They are lines and uh, straight lines, male and female energy for you. If you want to decode them, you have to understand uh, that uh, stonemasons have uh, so-called signs, uh, which are the um, six-lobe and the four-lobe traceries. Uh, here we have uh, squares and circles and uh, we have nested inside them, again, four circles and uh, four squares. If you put uh, the stonemason's mark there, you can see where exactly the stonemason's mark go. Um, all these uh, marks can be derived um, from uh, these traceries. Now, uh, let us now go to Egypt. There were mystery schools which initiated people into the fact that there's just one consciousness, that we were part of a single reality. Um, the reality was just there to make us uh, experience certain things, but uh, that we were never really separate from one another. Sacred geometry uses two tools, the circle, the, uh, said, excuse me, the um, compass and the ruler, but we also need to have a blank sheet. If we used squared paper, then of course we'd leave the paths of sacred geometry because each measure must develop out of itself. If I simply said, well, this line has to be five centimeters, well, that wouldn't be correct uh, because uh, human consciousness or uh, human perspective would enter into it. If I have white paper, blank paper, well, everything that I do should come out of itself. If I draw a circle, that's like a consciousness sphere or a path of consciousness, and even a line is like consciousness moving from point A to point B. All the religions know the world tree or the navel of the world. The closed circle, the pen, is considered the axis of the world, and the point where you start drawing is the navel of the world. And if you do a drawing, an artistic drawing, like you have a white piece of paper in front of you, you're a creator in that moment. You could actually take something that exists in your imagination and make it material that moment. You can actually draw a draft of an engine, you can write a love letter, you can draw a house, whatever. You're the creator, but there's a beginning, and that's the navel of the world. And if you take a compass and you open it, geometry says that we're now creating space. We extend, we stretch, and consciousness extends and stretches, and that's what it looks like. And it doesn't matter how big the circle is. Like, if I actually keep this presentation small in a small room, it's small. Here it's a big room, so it's a big circle. It's like our basic measure, our original measure, and we could show that this knowledge existed in Egypt and derived, you can find it in the holy scriptures of the world. Once you understand the language, once you can read it and you find the same thing all over and over again. Simple example. In Western culture, we're saying, in the Old Testament, there's Genesis. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We have no limit there, no line, but now we're creating a structure, a line. And then we can say, in the beginning, the drawer created an inside and an outside, a border. And over the centuries, it turned out to be that. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So consciousness could be right in the middle of it. And consciousness wants to experience itself and wants to experience what God created. So it goes to what was created new. In this case, the circle, the limit. 
and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters means the consciousness moves to the surface, does whatever it can already do, it knows how to do it, so it draws another circle. This doesn't have anything to do with creationism, something like that. It's just trying to describe how you can take the geometrical perspective to show how an earth was created. This is the first day of creation. A bladder of a fish or vesica pieces, that's what it's sometimes called, which is the overlapping of the two circles. Let's go back to Genesis again. It says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now we could ask, what does this drawing have to do with creation? Well, we have two circles, geometry, female, but there's four points that matter, the two intersections outside and the two centers of the circles. And if you ask a physicist what light is, he might just say, well, light can be considered an electromagnetic wave. There's an electrical component at perpendicular on that, there's a geometrical component. And if you then take those four points and you connect them, you get an axis, just like the magnetic structure of the light. But you can also take a different approach. From the drawing with the pentagon, you saw that we have nested structures in geometry. In the fish pattern, you can see two triangles that are back to back, and even in them, we have two equilateral triangles back to back and inside them as well and so on and so on. So we can learn something by actually analyzing light itself or we can learn something by actually looking at the recipients of light. Think back home. You want to listen to a radio station. So you take your receiver and you switch to the station in order to go into resonance as good as possible. Before you did that physically, you had like this knob in order to tune in those two. And if both are in resonance, an information transfer can take place. So we can learn something about the structure of light by looking at light recipients. And this is what it looks like in nature. So when maple tries to grow into light, it's trying to adapt to the structure of light. We have the leaves here that are perpendicular and perpendicular and perpendicular again. This plant does it the same way. The maple leaf was like 20, 30 centimeters big. This is two, three centimeters. And in philosophy, there's a statement saying something like, man is the measure of the universe. It's not man is the measure of all things. Somebody got that wrong at some point. It's man is the measure of the universe. And if you have a holographic structure that's self-similar, you can take some subject, some object from the universe and look at it and learn something about the structure of the whole universe. So let's take a look at man, at humans. We also have light recipients here in men. And that's what they look like. And the geometry of light, we can continue to analyze it further. And then what we see is this. It's the ball of the eye, the eye, the iris, and it's the pupil in the middle. And then it doesn't matter what creature we're looking at. We're all using the same geometry. Looking into the light field to perceive it, to decode it, just like in the frog in a cat. You can see it all over the place. You can also see it in the complex eyes. Here it's a little more complex, you could say. Is it maybe so, but even if we zoom in on them, we can see that this is a hexagon structure that's imitating the structure of light to go into resonance with it. But it doesn't stop here. There's more meaning to that symbol that we find in the first day of creation. Here we have the cathedral at Baal. Here we can see Jesus in that case, with a halo in the background. And that's the manvala. Manvala, that's the almond shape. But it's also a gate that's opening a new consciousness comes in. That's also how we could see it. And often it's shown like that in medieval writings. Unfortunately, I didn't bring a picture, but you can also get it with Mary and others, other saints. You can certainly observe that for yourselves. And if we just go back to the original the circle with a point in the center, this is the ideal center. We have one form, we have harmony, but still consciousness tries to divide. Like 
two, two pieces. It's all about two things. Dilemma, di, die, two. There's also like trouble all over the place, but we also have wholesomeness, twosomeness, and so on and so forth. It's like a non-stable and instable state, the number two. But still, consciousness decides to split up and become two. Usually you're adding three, like you're saying a tripod will never wobble or something like that, creating stability if you add another one, if you have three. But in this function, we could also say this, consciousness goes out of unity to step into a new world. And there's also a gate. The things that I'm saying here, they exist in my mind, my spirit, and through a gate, they step into space. Check the geometry of the mouth. You can see that it's like the bladder of a fish, the same kind of gate that you can see here. That's where Christ the crisis impulse moved into the well or something else. And we always have nests in geometry shapes. We have one bladder, we have to have a second one at a perpendicular angle to it. Check the mouth of your neighbor. You can see two bladders of two fish, basically. And, and all of us, we're pure geometry, inside and out. We're following this law of nature. You couldn't have come in here. You couldn't have come into this room without knowing the laws of geometry. And the human body has another mouth, the vulva in women. And the opening of the vulva, the gate, that brought you into the world is this picture right here. And for that reason, the overlapping circles, this drawing is often used by female cults in order to show that they stand for the creative power, the female element that gives birth to life, that brings life into the world. And that's basic structures derived from geometry. Right. If you want to go for mathematics here, you can see the three basic roots in ancient Egyptian mathematics that happen in the first step, the very first step. One, two, three, and five. We need the root of five for the golden ratio. But let's continue with pictures here. Let's imagine that's soap bubbles that we see right here, these two circles. And now we tilt this by 90 degrees and we look at it from the top. And that's what it looks like now. And here we have a new measure that we just created. It's the overlapping of the two circles right here. And the rule was, go to whatever is new, we're curious, we move towards the new, and we do whatever we have already learned to do, which is we draw another circle, which means consciousness has moved to here, and the next step probably is going to move here, just because there's a new measure. Try and find out what happens there, and draw another circle. And that's what it looks like. We would say it's the second day. On the second day, once again, we have female energy, we have circles, but we can add male information and combine it. Like we're drawing a big equilateral triangle, and you can see that every line goes through an intersection in the middle, like here. And here we can add a small equilateral triangle. And if we look at that, we now have four equilateral triangles. And the three triangles could be folded up, and then this is what you'd get. It's the tetrahedron. It's like a triangular pyramid. Information from the second day of creation, geometrical creation. Let's just remember that. We'll, we'll go back to that in a minute. But, you know, that's a perspective. The movement of consciousness doesn't stop here. We'll move into that intersection. Then we call it the third day, that's the fourth day, the fifth day. And if you have a good circle, it's really fascinating to see that. At this point, that's where three circles meet in one point. We have to go back there again. And if you ever wondered why creation has six days, you can see that it's a geometrical description or mission. And on the seventh day, he rested and contemplated his work and saw that it was good. But it doesn't stop here, not even here, because each circle corresponds to a sphere, and he was switching between dimensions. And you can certainly imagine this. The circle in space is a sphere or a waveform, a propagating light wave, whatever you might want to say. We went to the surface, and we moved all around 
passing six stations. But you could ask, what kind of a form is that movement of the sphere of the circle around that center circle? And there's a geometrical trick that we can apply. Within that bladder, we draw a connecting line, and then we dip right into the middle of that circle. We draw a new circle. I'll just eliminate the inner circle. We don't need it now, but it's still there. doesn't matter what circle I draw, I always move on the inner circle. And that's what it looks like. That's the next step. And let's condense that even more. Let's draw some more circles and even more circles. You can certainly go back home and use your compass to do it yourselves. And mathematicians would say, well, that's a torus. Think food. You could also say it's like a bagel or a donut. It's a hoop with a hole in the middle. Let's use our computers here. And that's what it looks like then. And so that you have a special sense of it, we'll tilt it slowly. And that's where we land. That's the form of each magnetic field. If you have a little stick magnet, there's magnetic field lines on the top and at the bottom. Or like here, the marble in the middle, that's our planet, and the field all around, that's the magnetic field of the Earth. Doesn't matter where you look, you'll always find the same structures. Let's move on. That's what it looks from the side. One vortex at the top, one at the bottom, and let's now look at a tomato or an apple. On top we can see a vortex and we can see one at the bottom as well. Let's look at a tree. The tree will absorb nutrients from the ground, moving it into the leaves or the fruits, and at the latest in the fall, the leaves fall down again to become nutrients to move up again. So we have a torus circuit that's shown here. Same thing applies to butterflies, for example. The wings will always be flapping in the torus field, and in the middle, it always looks like antennas that control the field. And look at the apple again. Like I said, we can learn something about the universe by analyzing man. We can also learn something by analyzing an apple. Let's take the apple. Let's cut it open like that. We can see it's a torus. If we cut it like that horizontally, we can see that we have a pentagon in the middle. And here we have like a condensed field, and we have more condensation. We have a pentagon inside, and on the outside we have ten vertices, but not all use five tomatoes, use two or three. The cucumber, I guess you've cut it thousands of times, but you've never really watched out for that. It's the number three again. And this is really interesting. It's a holographic structure. The fruits also have a memory. The apple is the fruit. And before the fruit, we had the blossom. And if you cut the apple open horizontally, you have a slice or half an apple. And you cut a thin slice, you hold it up against the light, and you can see the blossom is still here. And we actually derived a little bit of information from this simple pattern, but it doesn't appear. There's new intersections, so we add more circles. And even here, we have a 3D information inside. But I'm not changing anything about the measure. I'm only erasing a couple of lines to make it clearer exactly what happens. So this is what happens. That's what it looks like. In geometry, we're calling it the egg of life. But it's a cube consisting of eight spheres. And once we've reached that point, it's worth the while casting a look at this, a look at how we came to be. We're all starting life as an egg cell, as a sphere. Doesn't matter what kind of life you're looking at, everybody starts as an egg cell. It all starts with an egg, whatever creature you may be, frog or whatever. Inside, there's different structures. And here, I'm simplifying things. We have a nucleus, two centrioles, and now the set of chromosomes has to double. And then the central bodies send fibers that pull apart the DNA. But before they do that, something really exciting happens. The chromosomes, they alter in the shape of a star with 46 points, like in the apple. And we call this the mother star. But it's the very same thing. Whatever we see in the apple can be found again in the inside of a cell. Wherever life divides, we have the same patterns, the same pathways. The fibers pull apart. On the top, we have one set of chromosomes. We have one at the bottom. 
We have invagination, and we call this the first day of creation. When the two cells divide, we have four cells that develop, and usually that's shown as four points that form a quadrangle, but if you try and make four spheres a quadrangle in space, it doesn't work. What happens is these four spheres form a tetra Hedron. And the four spheres, when they divide, we have four new cells, which gives us a total of eight, and we have the egg of life. And of course, creation doesn't stop here. We know a lot about the geometry of man and at Leonardo. This is what it looks like. We are just as tall as we're wide. The span of my arms reflects my body height. And this square of four body cells is at a point where we have our genitals. So if you want to find the center of your body, you draw two diagonals and you find that point. A perspective of the first eight cells at the bottom is the view of a cube, a quadrangle, and geometrical patterns are always nested. The first eight cells have a field that they emit that's nested from the inside out. And at the end, you get the structure that we're growing into, the square that we have all around ourselves. If somebody actually says that you're as tall as wide, don't get nasty with him. Be nice, because he paid you compliments. He said, you are in perfect harmony. And development doesn't stop here. You can consider a torus a sphere where the top and the bottom pole have connected. The cell shell has become dissolved. Now we have the first eight cells still here, but they're getting invaginated like that, all the way to the bottom. And that's what it looks like. And simple creatures would stick here. Polyps actually would use that as the mouse and for excretion again, but in humans it's different. We get a vertical axis, and that's the placenta, that's going to be the placenta, this is going to be the navel cord, and at a right angle to the main axis, just like an apple, new life forms. The nervous system, the embryo, is going to develop. And we can also learn something by looking at the egg of a chicken. If you look at the egg white, you can see a cord, like a fiber inside. And that's the umbilical cord. And if you look at it under the microscope, this is what it looks like. And if you continue to look at it, it was pretty difficult to take a photo of it because the vortex is pretty big and it's getting condensed, it goes down, and that's what it looks like in nature, outside, in a storm, for instance. So you can see the structure is always the same. And the point where the vortex goes, this is like a hurricane, for example, and in people we also have something like that, and it's our navel, looks like in an apple. This is where the vortex once went. But you know, when the child is born, the navel is right in the middle of the body. And you can also do a rough schematical drawing, navel in the middle, and then you have a vortex structure to both sides. This is a melon. You can see it very nicely. This is where the life energy comes in. This is where vortexes form. And this could be like the head. This could be the legs. Then the baby is born, and the life energy the main supply happened via the navel up to that point. Then the baby takes the first breath, and then the energy supply switches over from that axis to the perpendicular axis. We then start absorbing energy from the top and the bottom, and that's what it looks like from the top. And in people that have more hair, it looks like that. So even here we can see a reflection of the structure of the information behind. And that's what it looks like in the universe. Wherever we look, as above, so below, we have the same structures. And there's a riddle. Like I said at the beginning, it's the squaring of the circle. We know that we all have a square around us. And if I stand up in front of you and I stretch out my arm like that, there's a point that I can reach. But that's how high I can get. I can actually try, but that's all I can reach. And the measure from there to the ground is equal to the diameter of the circle that I was drawing here. And this circle has the same 
circumference as the square that we have around us. So we have the squaring of the circle circular equation right inside us, but it doesn't stop here either. Inside the square, we can add two spheres. One sphere fits the square perfectly, and the second sphere is the one reaching from here to here. And this part was added up here, and those two spheres, those two circles, have the same ratio just as the diameter of the moon and the diameter of the Earth. If you don't believe me, take your pocket calculator, diameter of the Earth times four, circumference of the circle, then you have the formula here, and you get 50,925 kilometers. We're talking about geometry, right? So we have to also mention the golden ratio. I'm using a segment, calling it C divided outside of the center, and then I get a short A and a long one B. And the golden ratio is taking about where I need to divide so that the ratio long to short A to B is equal to long B to C, the full segment. And if you do that, you have a certain mathematical measure in order to stick to the pentagon. This segment is actually divided in the golden ratio here and here. And we're saying this is the short part, minor, and major, that's the long part, the long segment. The baby is born, the navel is in the center, we said that, and the navel, of course, shifts, it moves. And today the navel is exactly in the golden ratio of the human body. But the navel, if that's the golden ratio, and this is the middle, there's also a golden ratio at the bottom. And if I'm relaxed, you know where my fingers end, that's where the golden ratio at the bottom is. And I can also show you that the fingers are divided in the golden ratio. The whole body has the golden ratio all over it. And if we take a square, we started with a circle, standard circle, we could also say standard square. We draw a diagonal, we use a compass, and we put a circumference over the basic segment, so we have a length 1.618033, and so on and so forth, which we call phi. And that's the measure of the golden ratio here. At this point, that's where we have the harmonic ratio of the golden ratio. And if we do it up, we have a golden rectangle. Let me not give you the mathematics, but we can cut off the square, and here a rectangular part stays behind, which is another golden one again. You cut off a square again, and we still get the same thing again. As a result, we have a golden rectangle. You cut off a square again, and you get the same result again. Cut away again, cut away again, and you always get the golden rectangular section, and you get something like an approximation to a golden spiral, which is a little different, but it's very close to it. And that's the structure that we see in the Nautilus shell or in the galaxy, like here. And if you still feel like you have no business in mathematics or geometry, let's take a look at genealogy, the family tree. We know from the cell division, one cell, two cells, four, eight cells. You're up here, you're the happy person, and you have two parents, and your two parents have two parents again, and they have two parents again, and that's what it looks like, one, two, four, eight, and so on and so forth. And if you've ever tried to look at genealogy, it can be quite complex to understand the situation. But, you know, you can be so happy because you're no B. That's the family tree, the genealogy of a B. The queen will lay eggs, and if there's no fertilization, there's going to be a drone that comes out. And if there's fertilization, there's a female queen again. So let's start here with a man that there's only a female as an ancestor with a male and a female. So the female has two ancestors. And then you have the sequence of numbers that you can see on the right hand side. One, one, two, three, five, and so on and so forth. In people it was different, it was simple. They multiplied by two, by two, by two, by two. In the B it's different. One plus one is two. Two plus one is three. 
2 plus 3, 5, and so on and so forth. So each number is a result of the subtotal of the two ancestors, predecessors. And there was an Italian mathematician, Fibonacci, so it's called the Fibonacci series, and here you can see him, that's a picture. But if you want to look at the ratio of two consecutive numbers, if you want to calculate that, you can see the right-hand side, the blue numbers, 1, 2, 1.5, 1.66, 1.6. 1 and the step between two is getting smaller all the time. And then in the second but last, oh, you can see 1.618, and that's the number of the golden ratio. It's kind of a dampened oscillation, that's how you could see it. Let's look at the sunflower, for instance. If you look at that, you can see counter-rotating spiral, one moving that way and one moving that way. And we're counting like how many seeds there are in one spiral and how many in the other spiral. It's either like two Fibonacci numbers or two that have the golden ratio vis-a-vis -vis each other. We saw that before. Same number sequence here. And you keep listening to me, at least I hope so. Let's check the in a structure of the ear, we can see that we have a golden spiral right here. That's the receiver. You have to breathe as well. So here we have the lung. We have two lobes in each lung. On the left-hand side, two. On the right-hand one, three. Either you're a musician, you're saying it's a quintent, or you're looking at the Fibonacci sequence, then you can see that it's two numbers from the Fibonacci series. And it doesn't stop here. A child has four times five T's. And when you grow up, you have four times eight T's. And there's an old wisdom that says something like, God is sleeping in the stones, breathing in the plants, dreaming in the animals, and wakes up in humans. And that's how you find all the structures reflecting in people. You have the stones and the crystalline bones, animals in your blood, maybe. And here you can see it again. We have the same sequences, just like in the plants, even in ourselves. And it's the egg of life again. Remember, it's eight spheres and a cube. And you also know it from music. From C to C, that's one octave. And that's eight white and five black keys. And chemistry, the periodic system, is reflecting the structure of the atom. We have the first main group and so on and so forth, up to the eighth main group. That's the next octave then. So, noble uh, gases are part of a different uh, octave and uh, they uh, feel too noble to communicate um, with uh, the first group. But let us now look into the internal structure of the DNA. We have a DNA-shaped building after all. And you have a, a double helix, a double helix as it were, and it is self-similar again, at least uh, in this picture. And if we uh, take that line, it is a spiral again that consists of a spiral again, and there's a spiral inside again, same as in the Romanescu cauliflower. And the sequence of four base pairs describes, uh, describes one amino acid. So guanine, guanine for example, uh, that is one possibility. We have 64 variants. Uh, the DNA, however, only uses 20 or 21 um, plus two start and two stop codes. But if you calculate that, four possibilities in the first position, another four in the second and third, that gives you the 64 variants, and you find an 8 by 8 square. The number of 8 begins or doubles on itself again. And the I Ching from China is 3,000 years old or older, and it is like the blueprint of reality, the book of changes. And it describes the reality in 8 by 8 possibilities. And that is the same that we find in the DNA, if you want. However, the I Ching has 64 possibilities. Every variant is interpreted, although um, we with the DNA haven't gotten that far. But maybe it's just that we don't understand DNA properly yet. And the vertebral column also has 64. Uh, and so, again, eight. And we do talk about vertebrae, where you find the word uh, vortex again. And 
And if you look at the brain, well, uh, that is a vortex opening up. Or if we say um, we have a torus inside, well, then the brain um, would uh, be as the antenna of the butterfly in the vortex of uh, the uh, part and would control things. So we're back with people now. Uh, people um, are said to be harmonic, or you might say it's a representation of the number of five, the head and uh, the uh, two arms and the two legs. You will remember this here, structures are self-similar or scale invariant. I have uh, this from my home area. We're on a rock looking down, and uh, you see one piece of rock, and then you see more rocks further out. Well, uh, our ability to gauge distances, well, uh, that is uh, log logarithmic, uh, logarithmically scale invariant. Well, if I try to estimate how far away I'm from the microphone, I may be one centimeter out. Uh, if I look at the end of the room, it would be one meter, and that here, I couldn't tell, it might be 10 meters or so, and further out it would be one kilometer in accuracy that I can get. The further away I am, uh, the less accurate in absolute terms I am, but relatively speaking, it's uh, the same scale, the same invariance. Same with uh, our hearing sense. Uh, our uh, sense of hearing is also logarithmically uh, scale invariant. Uh, here we have the weber fechner law that bears that out. You find that uh, as the estimate distance, distance your hearing acuteness, uh, your visual sense, your sense of touch, uh, your sense of smell are all subject to this. Our senses are logarithmic because the world is logarithmic. The world is logarithmic or scale invariant, which is the basic structure of these uh, things, and our senses just observe that and have adopted the same measures. An example here, this is a graph which shows how the planets are arranged. The baseline, you might say, is given by the sun and the further up the planet, the greater the distance. That is, the further away we are, the greater the distance. And you can see it's a hyperbole. If we calibrate that, uh, then we end uh, with this, uh, which would be a straight line in a logarithmic room. The structure of uh, the universe, uh, that it's logarithmic or scale invariant, that is captured by the globing scaling theory. And it's uh, basically the same as uh, sacred geometry. Um, scaling is uh, scale invariance, and uh, global, that's the universe. And, uh, well, we, it's been discovered in particle resonances. It's been found in the fine structure of particles, and you always find that in the structure of organisms and how they vary in size. It's all been summarized in the global scaling theory, which gives you a picture from the very small to the very big, and then that is, means that there's just one background wave which influences all. Uh, today, scaling has been demonstrated for elementary particles, for the microwave background uh, radiation in physics, physical random processes in the atoms, in crystals, and so on. But why is it so? Why is it that all nature is logarithmic in scale? Now, if you have a vibrating string, uh, it always has an eigen uh, vibration, then you, you always have one basic tone or harmonic. Then there's a first, second, uh, fourth, fifth, and so harmonic. Now let's draw that. This is the first harmonic. This is a uh, magnification of a string that vibrates, and you can see what happens. This is the 20th harmonic. And all sounds start here or here in a guitar. Uh, you have a a board uh, in the beginning and the end, and everything between that must be integers. There are some numbers that go through the middle, and there are some numbers that avoid the middle, uh, even and odd numbers. And let's say uh, we don't take the odd numbers for this experiment, and this is what you get. Even numbers. Some numbers are divisible by four, and others are not. And those are not divisible by four are removed, and this is what we get. And again, we continue, and in the basic structure, we have the half string length, and musicians understand that, that's an octave, uh, the quarter, that's the uh, next octave, and so on and so forth. Uh, in a uh, 
vibrating string. We always have a fractal structure with octaves nested into one another. You might say there's a background wave which vibrates right, uh, with uh, certain intensifications and which is fractal in structure. So we can uh, be in a very small world, but we could also go out into space and then we'd have larger amplitudes. Now let's look at this photo. It's a castle in Dresden. And if we enlarge it, and you think it's a castle, isn't that? Let's now enlarge it. You remember that, yeah? It's a castle. Well, and uh, well, uh, there's a resolution for you. But if we uh, looked at the monitor in more detail, this is what you'd get. It's the background matrix, and uh, that's the matrix on which I've given the presentation. And some, uh, I've picked up some elements from the background ma matrix, and that's what reality is like. A grid, a grid wh where we're inside, everything is interconnected, and we just pick out information. And let us return to the Genesis pattern, or the Taurus for that matter. Well, of course, it doesn't end there, does it? A circle can be understood as a wave, a photon, or a light wave propagating, and that would be the next steps, and so on, and so forth, and so forth. An endless pattern, which is so finely structured that uh, at some point you don't detect this pattern anymore, just as you can't see the pixels of the monitor. And then you end up with this here, which um, uh, went uh, through the internet shortly, the Earth, the solar system, uh, the Earth. Is, uh, there's a moon circulating it, the sun, there are um, planets around it, then there's a galaxy with um, other things circulating around it. So no matter what level, it's the same pattern. And I found it amusing when I got the invitation. Uh, EMBL, did you see the logo? It's uh, an arrangement of circles in uh, this uh, six-sided structure, hexagonal structure. This is called the flower of life, and it is a, sy a symbol that you will find everywhere in uh, holy or uh, teaching or training places. Here in India, for instance, in the, the vicinity of this temple, that's what you find. Okay, this is Croatia, excuse me, um, Romania or Crete, the of Crete here. Just a few examples to, to demonstrate that this is a global phenomenon. And if we assume that people uh, were just a physical body, well, that's uh, not the whole truth. We have a field around us, a field with which we scan reality. Let us now ask a, a painter with special sensitivity, Alex Gray, for instance. Well, this is his a picture, a vortex in several places, and uh, then he calls, calls that the mental level, and uh, that really gives us the aspect of a torus. We know that the field of the heart has a size of nine meters. It is torus-shaped, too. The fields around the head are torus-formed as well because all fields are taller shaped and this is what it looked like in the past. These are fields around the head, but people just couldn't describe it in any other way at the time, I suspect. In the end, uh, this is what we come up with. This is what uh, you'll find in uh, some uh, esoteric schools. Uh, people have an energy field around them, and it has a small and a large field. Uh, sphere and a torus field around it, and um, that's uh, how we uh, are located in the large matrix, right? Uh, we move in the large matrix in this shape, and what we perceive as reality, what we see as a firm, the wall, the table, uh, that is just a standing wave in this information space between those two balls, or spheres. Brain research has evidence that, how do I put it, that uh, there's a small time lag between the beginning of an action and uh, the decision or perception of an action. So let's say in every moment we project the reality that we perceive, we project it outside, and only then do we perceive what we've seen. And we are creator and observers at the same time, but only we don't notice, don't realize that. You might joke and say, we don't see a tree. We just agreed that there is a tree.
Well, of course, a tree is still a beautiful thing, no doubt about that. This is just uh, to show you how we may possibly create our own reality. Let us now look at the background matrix, and it fits quite nicely into this room, doesn't it? It's round, and um, we are uh, looking at the outside of the sphere. There's some information that comes in, some information uh, that you absorb, that you realize, and let's uh, put it simply. <laughs> Thank you, it says. <laughs> Thank you. The Creator centers all units of creation. It is the Creator's energy which is creating creation continually. Universal mind is extended to every atom which moves around the Creator's omnipresent and immutable stillness, which man calls gravity. Our senses cannot acquire knowledge. They can only be informed of effects of motion, and they can be easily deceived. One only need to look at the moon as it races alongside of your car while you drive, or see the train tracks that meet on the horizon. Knowledge can only come through the mind. The Creator reveals itself through mind as the mind energy at the nucleus of every atom. All motion in the universe is the thinking mind of the Creator. The Creator's thinking is cyclic, but the energy source of the thinking is eternal. All of the energy of all creation is in the omnipresent vacuum of the zero universe of motion. The mistake made by academic scientists is that energy moves the omnipresent stillness of space never moves. It is the fulcrum from which all motion draws its energy to move, but the fulcrum never moves. Every ultramicroscopic point in the cosmic vacuum of space is a fulcrum from which the Creator's omniscient mind desire is extended to express the ideas of universal mind. The Creator's mind desire is the only energy in the universe. Motion is only a lever which expresses the energy extended to it from the fulcrum. Electricity is the lever which simulates energy as an extension of the idea which always remains in absolute rest. That being said, we must now address the fallacy of the two kinds of electricity labeled by academic sources as positive and negative. Let us observe how illogical and impossible this claim is. Electricity does one thing only. It divides an equilibrium into equal sexed pairs of male and female, spiraling red and blue lights respectively. It then compresses them until they unite to create what man calls matter, which is an explosive condition around a still point of omnipresent gravity. It does not require two forces to compress anything. When any compressed condition is released, it returns to stillness without any force whatsoever. The still vacuum of space is the universal equilibrium. Any compression within space is an abnormal tension or strain from universal stillness and absolute cold. The still magnetic universe is without tension, strain, motion, curvature, or heat. All matter is compressed motion, and all compressed motion is explosive as it desires to return to the balance of universal rest. The zero universe of magnetic stillness is balanced. All created matter and motion eventually returns to the normal still condition of space which is the cause of all effect and the source of all energy. Early scientists decided that there were two types of electricity because the two opposite conditions of living and dying, growing and decaying, heating and cooling, polarizing and depolarizing, as well as all other effects of motion are expressed in seemingly opposite directions by seemingly opposite forces. There are no opposite directions or forces. There are only divided sexes, which exert the same force in the same direction. The one force is compression, and the one direction 
is spiral. That which seems to be two are one when they are united. They could not unite if they were pursuing opposite directions, nor could they be one if they were opposites. Academic scientists did not account for the fact that motion is a cosmic abnormality, which is caused by a disturbance in universal stillness. The normal condition of the universe is a state of motionless rest. All motion is a created effect which emerges from rest and returns to it. Imagine a quiet pool of water into which a stone has been thrown. The normal quiet state of the pool has been disturbed by a force. The normal quiet state of the pool will return to rest and requires no opposite force to do so. Welcome to my numerology video on the number eight. I'm Brandy Joy and let's dive in. So do you see the number eight in your dreams or maybe in any visions during meditation work? Do you see the number eight repeatedly? I know I do. Do you have the life path number eight? Or maybe you simply want to understand the universe or the esoteric meaning of numbers. Numerology, right? Some people are just curious about the infinity sign and the many forms of eight that we're going to go over. So what you're going to learn, well, we're going to talk about how the number eight applies to the divine science we call sacred geometry. We will also explore the spiritual meaning of the number eight and the oracle systems like the I Ching, the tarot cards, and the astrology chart, as well as the tree of life. So where do we start? Well, let's start with the form, the shape. Let's begin with some sacred geometry. Sacred geometry shows the patterns of creation, right? So you start in sacred geometry with the little dot, right? The little dot and then the dot, you know, creates a circle, it expands out to a circle and, um, and then it duplicates itself. And when it does that, we end up with two circles. This is called the Vesica Pisces. The Vesica Pisces is the duality dimension, right? So we start with unity consciousness, that's God's source. And then once it splits, once it divides, we have duality, which is our life, our world, right? We have yin yang energy, we have masculine, feminine, everything's duality, everything's balance. And that is all about creation. So the universe is created by division as is the human body among every other living thing is created by division, right? These are cells that are, this is a cell that is, you know, uh, dividing itself. And you can see over here, um, you can see the number eight. It looks like a number eight, right? And that's representing uh, life. So the Vesica Pisces is considered the womb of the universe. All shapes are born from this duality, this division of the one, right? And in the middle there, you can see that all shapes are born there, right? Well, you can also see a fish, right? That's what you're seeing right there, the Vesica Pisces. That's the fish, Christ consciousness, the womb, right? That is um, the, it's, it's like the womb of our, our dimension, you know, nature and everything. And that's, that's the age we've been going through is the, the Pisces age. And that's why you see the symbol everywhere. Then we have the seed and the egg of life. All right. So as we, we have now split into two, right? You, you have two circles and now these circles keep dividing and then you end up with seven and that's the seed of life. And then you end up with eight circles and that is the egg of life. Now the egg of life is actually eight spheres, eight spheres. Now you can't see one in that right there because it's actually supposed to be four, right? Like a little box right there and then four behind it. So you can see four and then four. Now that creates um, the egg of life. 
right? You can see it here a little more clearly. This is Jar Charles Gilchrist. Uh, he has a company called CG Imaging where he talks about sacred geometry. He has a wonderful YouTube channel. Um, I suggest checking out. And he does a lot of artwork and stuff. And you can see that he has the eight spheres here. This is a cube of spheres. And that right there creates life. You can see the, the actual cell. That's a human cell right there on the right. That's eight spheres. So looking a little closer, you can see life development. You see the two cell stage where it divided. You have the eight, right? And then it goes to the four cell and then it jumps to the eight cell. And then it actually, this is within the first few hours of something being created, right? Um, and then you can see that it creates, it becomes like a, a little blob, right? From the eight cell stage, it jumps into this like little blob where it starts forming, right? So this is the first stages of life. And also the egg of life is also represented in creation, but also in musical scales. So everything in life is sound, right? So the egg of life represents the diatonic scale. You can see that the scale is C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then C again, right? So eight is like a copy of the original beginning, okay? So it's like it starts over again. All right, so creation also has seven levels or densities. The eighth density forming the first density of the next octave of experience just as the eighth note of a musical scale begins a new octave. And that comes from the Law of One series, which is a channeling from uh, some people back in the early 1980s that were talking about uh, the universe and um, the whole experience of, of life and the evolution of life and the different uh, parallel universes and different things like that. So the egg of life is um, the eight spheres, and that represents um, many different things that have to do with eight. Everything from the diatonic scale to the densities in our universe and creation. The fifth density is the density of light. And this is where we go between incarnations, right? So this is, uh, some people call this, you know, heaven or hell, right? This is just the place that your soul goes when it leaves the body. All right, that's the density of light. And then you have the density of unity, which is the angelic realm, because they are service to others. They're a higher dimension frequency. And then you have the seventh, which is all is one, the source. And then you start a new infinity at the number eight. So the eighth density is really creation of a new density, a new infinity, a new creation. Um, I know this is a little complex, but I'm not going to dive into this too deep today. I just want to kind of show you as an overview certain things about the number eight. So if you have questions, please let me know. You're welcome to ask me anything. I, I, I love to explore this stuff. So, all right. The flower of life is a very important part of our world. It's, it's all about creation, right? And when you keep getting these concentric circles going and going in infinity, right? You create and create. It creates life. And so you see this flower of life. You see this, this symbol all over the world. You see it in all of the ancient um, places where they, they have like stuff that we don't even know how they, they made these artifacts and, you know, etched things with, with certain things back in the day. Almost looked like they were lasered, right? And, and these are symbols of flower of life. These are symbols of sacred geometry and creation. And these circles, concentric circles, just can go on for infinity. You know, it's just circle, 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 circle. That's all they are. And those circles then create angles. You know, you, kind of, you get angles out of that. And uh, so it's really interesting. You can see the tree of life within this form. You can see so many different things about our creation within this one form. So that brings us to the atom, right? The law, remember, the law of opposing forces produces stability. And so you can see here we have the electrons on the outside of the atom swinging around. And then on the inside, we have protons and neutrons. Okay, so the electrons are yin energy. They are magnetic energy. 
And then on the inside, the protons are that light energy, that yang energy, that masculine electrical energy. And so they create a vortex. And the neutrons are neutral energy. Some people even call this like the God energy. It's just neutral, the source energy. Because once it goes out in yin yang, you have the electrical and the magnetic, right? And that's duality. And that's how we create the vortex. And so everything's made of these atoms. Right? So these are opposing forces and they create stability. And the really cool thing about this form, I'm going to show you here in a minute. All right, so this is the matrix of reality. Matter is actually a mirage. And everything is frequency. Everything is movement. Everything is sound. Right? Everything is, are these energy vortexes. That's all they are. So if you amplify a frequency, a sound, you know, a frequency, the structure of matter actually changes. So think about an opera singer or somebody that <laughs> really knows how to scream really well, raise their pitch, right? Um, if you get it high enough, loud enough, it actually changes and breaks the glass, right? So eight is magic. Eight is alchemy. Eight is transformation. Eight is change, right? So you can see the number eight and all of these little esoteric things that we're going to talk about coming up here. But it's all about transformation and change when it comes to the number eight. But the only constant in life is change. And that is what that represents. The infinity symbol is the only constant is that things keep moving and things keep changing. Right? So here we have these shapes, right? They look different, but they're actually all the same. They're all the same shape. So they all have the same frequency, right? Now, if you look up here at the hexagram, the six pointed star, look at it. It's actually also represented in the atom. The atom is the six pointed star. So the hexagram sits within the hexagon. So if I were to draw lines around either of those, the atom or the star, if I drew lines around them, I want you to look down there at the right, at the bottom, you see the cube? That right there is, is actually the outside of the six-pointed star. If you look at it, if you draw a line from the top over to the one corner, right, and then down on the side, look over here at the cube, and you see those lines? 
that cube is on the outside of the six-pointed star and or the atom. So the hexagram sits within the hexagon. So uh, the cube down there is the hexagon. The hexagram, the six-pointed star, and the hexagon is a cube. A cube has eight corners. Everything in life is represented by the cube, its physical manifestation. So look at the egg of life above the cube. Okay. Remember, this is eight spheres, four and four. And turned at the angle that I have it in, you can see that it's the hexagram. But it's made with eight spheres, just like the cube has eight corners. Now you see how they all tie together, right? So when you see these symbols, know that they are representing two different numbers, six and eight. This right here, same frequency, eight corners on the cube. And if you fold out the cube, you have the cross. Interesting, right? So the number eight represents the connection of the all. It is the symbol of infinite consciousness and the soul evolution back to oneness. It's connection. That is the number eight. And that is why it's so important. The eighth chakra is called the star. And that sits way above your head up there. It's also called the seat of the soul. It's connected to infinite energy or God source energy. It was a lot of people like to call it. Well, every man and every woman is a star as Alistair Crowley says, and that is the seat of the soul. And that is your connection to the divine. In the beginning of our lives, in our mother's wombs, we start as one sphere, then gradually grew into various geometric forms, all life forms, trees, plants, dogs, cats, everything originate from the same geometrical and structural patterns of creation. All life forms are based on these geometrical patterns. These geometrical relationships are important to perceive for two reasons. One, so that your left brain can actually see comprehend and realize that creation is not based on Darwinian's theory of evolution, that life is based on an accidental fluke. There is order in creation. There are cymatics, protons, mathematics, and geometry involved in our creation and in all creation. And through seeing this process of creation, you will begin to realize the unity of all life. Every known life form begins as a sphere. The sphere in relationship to humans is known as the ovum. The ovum is a perfectly round circle. This is our beginning as a perfectly round sphere. All of us begin as a sphere. Around the ovum is a membrane called the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida has to do with why the ancients put two circles around the flower of life instead of just one or none at all. Inside the membrane is a liquid and inside that liquid there's another perfectly round sphere called the female pronucleus, which contains 22 plus 1 chromosomes, half the chromosomes necessary to create a human body. The number of chromosomes changes depending on the life form, and those particular chromosomes are different in every life form. We start as the female ovum 
in our mother's reproductive system, waiting to be joined by our male counterpart. It does only take one sperm to fertilize an egg, but it takes hundreds of sperm to make that process possible. Out of those hundreds of sperm, 10, 11, or 12 must come together and form a pattern around the surface of the ovum that allows the 11th, 12th, or 13th sperm to enter the ovum. One sperm cannot get through the membrane without the help from the other 10, 11, or 12 sperm. The chosen sperm gets in through the zona pellucia with the help of the other sperm and then starts swimming toward the female pronucleus. Once this happens, the sperm's tail breaks off and disappears. Next, the tiny sperm's head expands and enlarges to a perfect sphere, becoming the male pronucleus. It becomes exactly the same size as the female pronucleus, and it contains the other half of the necessary biological information. Next, they pass through each other and form a geometrical relationship called the vesica pisces. At that exact moment, the male and female pronuclei form the image of the first motion of the first day of Genesis, and literally all the information of the reality and light is contained in that geometry. Drunvalo theorizes that the female determines which sperm will enter and that the male sperm has to have a matching spherical diameter identical to the female's in order for the male sperm to enter the ovum and for fertilization to occur. After the two pronuclei, the male and female, make a vesica pisces, the male pronucleus continues to permeate the female pronucleus until they are one. At this time, it is called a human zygote, the first cell of the human body. We begin as a sphere before we were created into our fully formed human body. And to be specific, we were a sphere within a sphere. The human zygote is about 200 times bigger than the average cell in the human body, so big it can be seen with the naked eye. When it divides into two, each of those two cells are half the original size. The cells keep dividing like this, getting smaller and smaller until they have divided eight times and number 512. At that point, the average cell size of the human body is reached. When that happens, mitosis continues and the dividing cells expand beyond the boundaries of the original zona pellucida. All life uses this process. The next thing that happens in the conception process is that those little polar bodies begin to migrate through the zona pellucida. One goes down and becomes the south pole and the other becomes the north pole. Then out of nowhere a tube appears running right down through the center of the cell. Then the chromosomes break in half and half of them line up along one side of the tube and half along the other. This is also evident in human energy fields. It's very much like the energetics of an adult human being. We have a similar sphere of energy around us. We have a North Pole and a South Pole, and we have a tube running right down through our body. Half of our bodies are on the Half of our bodies are on one side of that tube, and the other half is on the other side of the tube. The very picture, this picture is very much like the energy field of an adult human being. After the chromosomes have lined up along the two sides of the tube, they form into two cells, 
and on each side of the tube and each cell contains 44 plus 2 chromosomes. The next step is that the cells divide again, going from 2 to 4, a binary sequence. 1, 2, 3, 4, 16, and so on. According to Drungvalo, the first four cells actually form a tetrahedron, not a square. A tetrahedron is one of the platonic solids, and the apex of the first tetrahedron points either to the North Pole or the South Pole. A tetrahedron in a 2D form is a triangle, and it pointing upward or downward designates whether it is a symbol of water or fire. Water pertaining to a female sex and fire pertaining to a male sex. Depending on the apex of the tetrahedron, whether it is pointing up or down, determines the sex of the unborn baby. Moving on. Next, the cells divide into eight. They form one tetrahedron facing up and one tetrahedron facing down, forming the star tetrahedron. This is the egg of life. This form came out of Genesis. It came out of Yah's second rotation. Every single life, every single life known must pass through the egg of life. According to Drunvalo, this point where the original eight cells form a star tetrahedron or a cube is one of the most important points in the creation of the body. The most important quality of these original cells is that they appear to be identical. There appears to be nothing different about them at all. These original eight cells are closer to who we really are than our physical body is. They are closer to our nature. These eight cells are immortal relative to our bodies. You have to keep in mind that we get a brand new body every five to seven years. Every single cell in our body dies within a five to seven year period and is replaced with a new one, except for the original eight cells. They remain alive from the time we are conceived until the time we die and leave our bodies. All the other cells go through their life cycles, but not these original eight cells. These cells are centered in the precise geometric center of our body, which is slightly above the perineum. For the female, the perineum is located between the anus and the vagina. For the male, it's between the anus and the scrotum. There's a little piece of skin there, and even though there's not a physical opening, there is actually an energetic opening. That is where the central tube runs through your body coming out the top through the crown chakra at the top of your head. If you look at a newborn baby during the first few weeks, you'll see the top of its head pulsing. If you were to look at the bottom of the baby at its perineum, you'd see the same pulsing. That's because the baby is breathing in the proper way. Both ends are pulsing because the electromagnetics are flowing from the two poles coming not only from the top down, but from the bottom up and meeting. From the point where the original eight cells are located, it's the same distance to the top of your head as it is to the bottom of your feet. And the cells are arranged just as they were when they first came down into existence in the egg of life pattern, north up, south down. Drunvalo further states that human beings do not grow like a string bean. 
getting longer and longer, we actually grow radially in 360 degrees from the original eight cells. After the eight cell division, it divides into 16 cells, whereupon it forms another cube or star tetrahedron on the end. This is the last time it will be symmetrical. When it divides into 32, 16 cells are in the middle and 16 on the outside. At the next division, there are 32 more cells. The cells start to lose their symmetry and start looking more like a blob. Drunvalo states that the blob has consciousness in it, but if you, but if you know anything about water as to how it is conscious already, then you know there was life and consciousness already existing from the first fear, already existing in the open. Once it gets to this state, it becomes a perfect hollow sphere. Then the North Pole starts dropping through the space inside, going down toward the South Pole. And the South Pole comes up through the space to meet the North Pole. The hollow sphere then becomes a torus, a spherical torus. Every single known life form goes through this torus stage. This information in the torus shape is called the morula. After this, the expansion goes beyond the zona pellucida and the cells begin to differentiate. The hollow space inside the torus becomes the lungs. The north pole becomes the mouth. The south pole becomes the anus, and all the internal organs form inside the tube that runs through the middle. Drunvalo theorizes that this might be why biblical tradition says that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is an apple tree. So you can see, we start out as a sphere, the ovum. We then move to a star tetrahedron at four cells, then on to two interlocked tetrahedrons at eight cells. From two cubes at 16 cells, we turn back into a sphere beginning at 32 cells, and from the sphere, we become a torus at 512 cells. All of these forms are sacred shapes that come out of the first informational system of the fruit of life, which is based on Metatron's cube. shape which gives stability to the whole structure and this is the star tetrahedron and its reflection is the flower of life pattern that is on the internet by the way what is magnetism it is uh, simply a, uh, an expression of the loss of the potential of dielectricity which must only and necessitatively form the geometry which we call magnetism which is the creation of space and volume and force and motion all of these are one and the same thing and that's the power as manifest but not the power and true which is completely unmanifest necessitatively and logically so
Platonic, specifically monistic Platonic, i.e. Uh, um, Platinian, uh, Neoplatonic, which is all the same thing, and is all uh, monistic uh, transcendence uh, metaphysics, that they have in common that nobody understands, and I mean nobody, is that all of you people approach metaphysics, I mean hardcore metaphysics, from the standpoint of what can I do, what sort of practice could I do to make life easier? Or how can I get richer or have better sex drive or uh, be happier? And I'm going to tell you flat out as a ancient Greek translator and a Prakrit translator and someone who translates Romanized Sanskrit that no branch of hardcore monistic metaphysics teaches this bull, bull crap. They teach transcendence. Udam soto. Nyavriti. Nisbandu. They don't teach about improving your life. None of them do. They teach about transcendence. Here's the key word, transcendence. What do you think that means? Do you think that is about improving this life? 